next post was Mozambique. I bet you could not point it out on a map or even spell it. It's in Southeast Africa. Civil unrest forced us to leave in the middle of the night and we were stopped by a band of guerrilla rebels with very long machine guns pointed at our heads. Luckily, the diplomatic passports got us out of that bind, but I can stand here today and remember that feeling like it was yesterday. I faced that feeling many times again in my life, and if you can face down a machine gun, you can face down any fear, professional or personal. Map, map stop number four, face your fears. Don't run, deal with them, and face your fear, fears. Our next post is South Africa, and for me, it was a multiracial boarding school in Swaziland because my father refused to send me to an all-white school nearby. Those next two years really shaped who I am today. I lived on the top of a mountain in Swaziland for two years as a minority. I was a minority because I was white, and I was a minority because I was a Christian. Because of that, I don't see color, and I don't treat minorities differently. Stop number five, look beyond the surface. Look for what is real, look beyond the surface. So because I don't see color, I fell in love with an Indian boy. Keep in mind, this was during apartheid, and it was illegal. So we both lived in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we could not see each other during school breaks. Because we were young and crazy, we decided to try anyway. There was one multiracial restaurant at the top of a hotel, so we made a plan to meet there. We could eat at the same place, but not at the same table. We never even made it to the restaurant. We were standing six feet apart, looking at the view. He was showing me where he lived. We were not holding hands. We were not touching. We were, we were trying to look as if we weren't even talking to each other, and we got arrested in about five minutes. They took us down to the basement of the building, and I, as a 13-year-old, was lecturing them, these big police officers in full gear, on how we don't judge people by the color of their skin, where I come from. They didn't care and they didn't listen. They proceeded to hit him with a club over and over. They did let me call my father, who came and rescued us once again with that diplomatic passport. Like I had to stare down fear with machine guns, I had to register in my heart that evil still exists. Stop number six. You need to have thick skin. That's the real world. You need to have thick skin. So from monkeys to tarantulas to boarding school to restrictive laws and arrests, the one thing I can tell you is that my family are all adventurers, and that is how I learned how to be adaptable. In everything I have ever done in my life, I have called on that spirit of adventure, from going back to Africa and working in Somalia, to facing infertility for a very long time, and to running a company I never thought I would run. Even sitting down with my four teenagers, I call that an adventure. Stop number seven is find your adventure. Live life to the fullest. So I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps and join the Foreign Service. Instead of government work, I got an internship as a senior in college at George Washington University, and they offered me a job when I graduated. I went back to Africa, and I worked on an agroforestry project in Somalia. This is quite some time ago. The project had been funded by USAID three years before I got there, and then I worked on that project for two years. At the end of those two years, the government felt as if they had made a lot of progress. They were trying to teach the Somalis to grow trees instead of slashing and burning them. In five years, there were thousands of trees planted that would hopefully be left to grow in peace. When the government, U.S. government decided to not renew that contract to fund more projects in that area, the Somalis were very mad. They ran out and they pulled all those trees out of the ground. I was devastated. I decided then and there that that was not the job for me. I could not devote my life to uplifting the status of people in the third world just to watch it be ruined in a matter of hours. So I quit my job and I returned to the States. The only job I could find was a 100% commission paid sales advertising job. And it was through cold calling in the yellow pages that I made an appointment to sell an ad to Reston Limousine. It took me two months to close that deal and on the final appointment, William Bowery, the owner, invited me out to dinner. 
He said he could. Soon we were dating, and he asked me to quit my job. He said he could not afford to pay me, but he would pay my bills. <laughs> so with, within one year, we got married. And yes, you can say I found my husband in the yellow pages. <laughs> So I started out as a reservationist, and I asked, why am I taking all the reservations? And he said, well, he was from Lebanon, and he had an accent, and he said, Americans like to do business with Americans. So then I learned invoicing, and then I learned payroll, and then I learned how to dispatch. Soon I was doing everything. Truth is, I love this job. For the first time in my life, the harder I worked, the more money I made. The company was all corporate at the time, and I asked him, why don't we do weddings? And he said, I don't like to deal with pride. <laughs> so I said, I will deal with brides. Let's face it, women are event planners, and we love anything to do with weddings. I bought a list of brides, and I cold called them, and I mailed them postcards. No limousine companies were doing that. Within a year, we were doing 50 weddings a weekend. Wow.